morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. What a great day to be in God's house together. This whole weekend has been just an awesome weekend of worship to him. And if we haven't met yet, I am Rebecca, my husband Brian. And what a joy to get to share the word together today. It has been a delight for me over this last year to get to join the pastoral team here, filling Heidi's mat leave. I'm here doing that until July, and it's been fantastic for a couple of different reasons. One, as Brian steps into the lead pastor role this year, it's been a delight to get to work side by side a little more together this year. Also, it's been so neat for me, for God to be allowing me to bring out my heart, my giftings, my passions that he's placed in me to serve the house as well. So it's exciting for us to get to share together today. And I thought before we get started, we probably should clear up a few technical things. I'm a little concerned you're going <laughs> off the script. So <laughs> normally I sit in the front over here. It gives me a great angle. I can see Bri really well. I, I can give him signals when needed, you know, like the watch tap or like, you know, you're, you're going too fast. or It's going to be kind of hard for you to see me right next to me here. So I thought we would just come to an understanding, all of us, that if I do this, okay, it means you're hogging and you need to <laughs> share a little bit more because we know he's passionate and he can really, really go for it, right? Uh, okay, thank you for that. Always being by my side. It also something came to my mind that as we do this as a team, we're on a display as a team. <laughs> True. In front of all these people watching us. So we better get along well here and behave ourselves, I think, right? Yeah. We are excited to bring the message together. Uh, we talk a lot about what are we sensing God doing in the house and where do we see him moving us forward. And as we prayed toward this morning, we were reflecting back on the uh, messages from the series of this month. Uh, Pastor Steve bringing the message three Sundays ago of how it, the Lord is to be the Lord of all. And we sometimes call out to Jesus saying, save me, I, I need help, like Jesus, you need to save me now. But then when it comes time to handing over control, it's a bit of a power struggle to release to God and trust him. But as Pastor shared with us, when we recognize he's Savior and Lord and making him Lord of all, then we can trust him to lead us in all things. And then it was two weeks ago that Pastor Nathan brought our message as well. And he talked about knowing our identity in Christ. He challenged us, didn't he, to say, do you know who God says you are? Because, church, this is going to impact not just our relationship with God. It impacts our relationship with each other, right? And he highlighted that there's three things we all desire to be significant, to be accepted and secure in our lives, and that we need to have this settled in order for us to do our relationships well. And then last Sunday, Pastor Joseph brought us the message about escape the ordinary, and I got excited as he started to unpack that message. Uh, it was stirring within me because he said what we want to do to escape the ordinary is to invite God into our lives, into our families, our relationships. As we do so, we're inviting him to do something supernatural in us, something bigger than us. And I relate with that and I say, oh, yes, God, do more in me than I want to do, than I can do. You, I believe you can do it. Because, and I like to title, Escape the Ordinary, because our human tendency is to do ordinary. <laughs> we default to it. We, we succumb to the ordinary. And don't challenge me on this, because I see where you sit every Sunday, <laughs> and you land in your ordinary spot. <laughs> well, not always, but, but when we invite God in, he takes us into uh, greater, bigger things, more exciting things, things that are of his divine plan and purpose. And so some of these are the messages that are leading us toward this morning's message. And this morning we're continuing to talk about going forward, right? Mm -hmm. Forward in relationships, because that's our theme for this year. And this morning we're focusing on one of my favorite topics, children, mm -hmm. children and families. We want to take a look at the word and see what does Jesus have to say about children and what is he actually teaching us about people in general, all generations, all types of people. And this is what we're going to look into together this morning. Because what we want to encourage us as a church is to encourage us to look at every generation 
every demographic of society, every people group, and make it easy for people to find Jesus, to come to Jesus. May we as a church not make it difficult. May we so make it inviting for people to come into the kingdom. So I encourage you to open up to Mark chapter 10 this morning. That's our text where Rebecca and I are going to pull some learning and teaching from today. Mark chapter 10, and I want to start at verse 13. And as I just highlight the title of, let the little children come to Jesus, you already know some of the context to this. But listen into what God's teaching us for here and now in today's day and time. Mark 10, verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and he blessed them. This text that we are going to focus in on for some time this morning is something that we need to take note of and come with a submitted heart saying, I don't have it all figured out. Lord Jesus, teach me. Father, teach me this morning. The setting of this text that Mark records is in the midst of Jesus doing some miracles. It's in a time period where the crowds were following after him. They were eager to get close to him. They wanted to experience something that he had, that he was imparting to people. We also see that uh, there was teaching going on. Jesus was teaching the disciples. And so recognize this crowd that is pressing in because they want what they have heard or seen that Jesus has been um, imparting to people. And while they're pressing in in this way, Jesus' closest followers, the disciples, were the ones who said, wait a second, parents, kids, end of the line. You know, step aside. Uh, and I wonder what Jesus was thinking, or what the disciples were thinking in this moment. Were they thinking that Jesus doesn't have time for kids? <laughs> that he's got more important issues to deal with, and that's what caused them to just go, oh, children, step aside. Parents, step aside. We don't have time for this. But then there's something else unfolding. As you look at the parents, what kind of person would parents be so eager to bring their kids to? What kind of person would they want their children to be touched and blessed by? And that's a bit of the heart of Jesus that we want to look for this morning. So this is the context that we want to bring some teaching to us this morning for you to ask, what, what do I see in this text? What do I learn? What is God wanting to teach me this morning from this passage? The first thing that I want to highlight for you that we do learn and we do see when we look at Mark 10 here is that even children are valuable to God. Now that might sound like a bit of a funny statement, right? Even children? Well, let me explain. Because when we're reading scripture, we're looking at it in the context of the day. And during this time, children were not exactly seen as valued members of society. They might have been prized by their families, but largely they were ignored by society. They weren't considered of much attention outside of their family unit, and often they would be considered property, a nuisance. So even children are valuable to God. Jesus was bringing a completely different message to the people than they were used to. And this is what Jesus did. He made time for them, right? He said, come, come. He, I can picture him motioning to them, inviting them into his inner circle, right? He put them right up on his lap and he showed them affection. And if we think back to the miracles that are recorded of Jesus, many of them focused also around children. Children carry great value in his eyes because we know this, don't we, church? The Father values them as well. He said, before you were born, I knew you. And so Jesus was communicating how valuable these kids are. And Jesus actually got mad at the disciples. He got indignant with the people when they mistreated the kids or showed them lesser value. Mark records in chapter 9, the previous chapter, he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. 
These are serious words, right, from Jesus and from the Father. They were serious about protecting and loving the innocence of children that they were welcoming into their presence. So as we highlight this, for us to see this point that even children are valuable to God, what I also want us to recognize and see is that even disciples made mistakes and judged others. <laughs> even the disciples. You've heard of NPP around here, right? No perfect people, no perfect pastors, no perfect parents. Let me introduce to you NPD. <laughs> No perfect disciples either. It's so tempting, it's so easy and from a human nature perspective for us to become self-righteous, self-important, to even to slip into that mode of being religious and thinking that's better than the alternative. But the 12, the closest to Jesus, the ones that he picked and called to follow after him, really, they could trip up and make a mistake? Church, take note of that. That if the disciples are making a mistake, it's mistakes are not a, um, beneath any of us to fall into the trap of doing. The disciples were walking close to Jesus and he was teaching them. And yet they fell into this trap of thinking that they had everything kind of figured out. Maybe they thought they knew what was on the rabbi, the master's itinerary for the day. They knew what Jesus was going to address, and it certainly wasn't these smelly, noisy little children. So parents, just, just back away, all right? They thought they had it figured out, but they became uh, self-presumptuous in thinking, I've got this. I know what isn't on the Father's or on Jesus' agenda. It's not only easy for us to slip into this mistake, but it's very tempting for us to do this to begin to judge or rebuke others or to misread their actions or intentions and, and therefore we just kind of write them off as, I know better than them. I know what's going on here, so I'm going to take control of the situation. A reality check for us is that God not only sees us when we have these self-righteous attitudes, he already knows what we're thinking on the inside. So he knows what's churning in our minds and what we might be mulling over and considering blurting out of our mouths. It can be pride that leads us down this trail. I've got it figured out. I've been hanging out in the church long enough. I know what's needed here. Uh, I, I've got, I understand scripture better than that person, so I'll correct them. It's so easy for us to fall into this mode, this pattern, make the same mistake the disciples did. And that's why it's not surprising that we see Jesus using a child to humble them and bring their attention down. The object lesson is centered right around children in that moment. So the children are valuable. Even children are valuable. And even disciples, even us, the church, we make mistakes, right? And we judge. The third thing I want to bring to you this morning is that the kingdom belongs to even these. These are Jesus' words, right? Mm -hmm. When he's talking about the children, the kingdom belongs belongs to them. And this is one of the things I love the most about Jesus' teaching, is that when he was showing his disciples and the people that were listening to him about the kingdom of God, he completely surprised them because it was completely upside down to what they already knew, wasn't it? It was completely upside down to what the world knew at that time. The kingdom belongs to such as these, the children. Can you imagine the religious leaders, can you imagine how insulted they were in that moment that Jesus was saying that the kingdom didn't belong to the most devout or the most religious ones, the ones that looked the most holy, but to children? Wow, I would have loved to have seen their faces. In this lesson, Jesus is answering a question for us, and the disciples might not have asked specifically, so who's fit to enter the kingdom of God? But that's what they wanted to know, and that's what Jesus was answering. He was saying, come like a child. That is who is welcome in my kingdom. And I'm wondering if sometimes we, maybe I'm just alone in this, but do we as the church, do we as Jesus followers do the same thing as the disciples at time? Do we decide someone's too old, too young, too rich, or too poor to come into the kingdom? Because Jesus said that is not the way it works. It's not the religious. It's not the accomplished. It's not the cleanest ones. It's the ones who have a heart for coming to me 
and receiving freedom in my kingdom. That's who belongs to the kingdom. And it's so true that as Mark's recording here this text that we're focusing on, Rebecca already mentioned another reference in chapter 9 where Jesus addresses children and how they were being treated. There's a second reference in chapter 9, verse, verse 36. And it's the, in the context the disciples were struggling over, uh, um, in, in the chapter 9, struggling over who's the greatest in the kingdom. Then there's this issue of sin and are they neglecting the children even to the point of causing them to sin? And in verse 36, Jesus took a child whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Jesus, again, is using a child to communicate the importance of welcoming all generations, all parts of society, recognizing that in a child there was something that the father valued. And he was saying, there's something to learn and, and to see here that I've brought before you this object lesson. And church, we want you to, we want us to cue into this, to recognize there's something to learn from Jesus. We don't have it all figured out on our own. There's something to learn from children. You know that you've learned things from children. Pause and just observe a child. Last night at Waterloo Regional Worships, as we were sitting here, we were watching kids worship and lift their hands and just begin to dance and, and then dance around. And after they did that, they would stop and they'd look up at the adults. And I'm sometimes wondering, were they looking at the adults to learn from them? Or are they looking at the adults at me to say, are you learning from me? <laughs> this is how to worship Jesus. We have something to learn from children. We have something to learn from one another. That's why God put us in a number of different people groups to learn from one another as we come together into his kingdom. Our last point that Rebecca and I want to highlight this morning out of this text is that you can see that Jesus blessed the children. Verse 16, he took them into his presence, into his care, into his closeness. Mark highlights in verse 9, he pulled them right close to him. And he laid his hands on them and he blesses them. I want to recognize that Jesus still wants to bless people. He wants the all people groups to come. And he wants to lay hands on and impart something is what a blessing is. To impart the Father's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. To impart the Father's heart so that children and young people and young adults and prime lifers in all generations, all languages, all people groups understand that there's a Father who loves them. Jesus did this specifically, and he only did what the Father instructed him to do and what was also on the Father's agenda. You see, as he said, as you welcome this child, you also welcome the one who sent me. So as I bless you, I'm also blessing you in the name of the Father who has sent me. So church, in light of this text and where we're at this morning, we just so want to encourage us as a church body, as followers of Jesus, Let's make it easy for people to come to Jesus. Let's make it easy for them, for the world, to come into the kingdom of God. That's good. That's good. This week while we were looking at the scripture together and talking it over, we were both reminded of how much both of us just have such a deep love, not only for children, but for all the generations. And we were reflecting on our deep love for children. And in fact, it was when we were, just dating that we were already talking about. Hey, I wonder how many kids God will bring into our family. Remember that? That was a long time ago. I was ago. a little scared back then when you <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> ah, the truth is God has brought many kids into our home and through our home. And it's not just children that we love. And it's the youth too. Our hearts just beat for them. For the 2020s, the young adults, we love them too. We love doing life with you, the adults, serving together. And our older adults, my heart is connected to so many of you. We clearly love all the generations. And often people will say to me, what's it like? Like you're a pastor, you're a social worker. How do you, like, do you get sick of being around people? <laughs> I say no, because God has given us a love for people. That's just something he's placed in us. It's a passion. It's a joy. It's what he places in us. And it's not just kids even though kids are so close to our heart. 
it's all the generations. And it's not just pastor, social worker, leader people that he places a love for people. It's in his church that he wants to place a love for people. All of us the same way. And Rebecca and I kind of did a survey. We kind of looked back over the last few years and said, what are the key points in our life where God started to expose us or allow us to experience something so that we could get his heart and understand the Father's heart? And one of the things that Rebecca referred to was as we started to connect to Koinonia and call it our church home, it was a short time then that we were invited to be into the young adult generation, the 2020s. Pastor Steve invited us, and it was our first 2020 weekend to go and speak with them that weekend. And God began to stir something in our hearts for that generation. And we're still walking with 2020s, and there's a service tonight that we get to speak at, a 2020 service. Reminder, 2020s in the house, service tonight at 7 o'clock. We're still walking with this generation. But then a, a short time later, God opened another opportunity for me here in the house uh, we had a need for some pastoral leadership with our Impact Youth. And so Pastor Steve and the team invited me to connect with Impact Youth. And I got to know some of the teenagers and some of the fun times we had and begin to work with the leadership team and discipling them and, and saying, no, this is God's heart. Let's, let's disciple this generation of, of teenagers in the house. And then this year, we, we started to see how God began to expose Rebecca to our kids' ministry and kids' families. And we're like, Lord, you keep showing us your heart for these different generations. And we recognize that that was him stirring something in us to recognize that he loves all generations. He loves all people groups. Tell us a little bit about your exposure and how the Father opened your heart to love different people groups. Through my years of being a social worker in the community, God has opened my heart so much more to have eyes open to see the people who are set aside. So whether that's folks who have unique abilities, some of our special needs kids or adults, people new to Canada, uh, children, the people who are vulnerable and set aside, the Holy Spirit has stirred on my heart. These are the people that I'm calling you to love. It's not these people. It, we are all his people. And, yeah. and these folks need the kingdom of God. And so that's one of the things the Holy Spirit has had on my heart is all people belong in the kingdom. And he's had to teach me that. And so would, let's bring an application to the message this morning, church. We want to make it easy for all people to come to Jesus, for all people to come into the kingdom. So There's some to. obvious do's and don'ts that we can look at in this passage from Mark 10. And when we take a look at how Jesus is teaching, that's when we learn the application from Scripture, right? So we want to take a look at what Jesus is doing here with the disciples. And I'm asking myself, okay, is this the spirit of Christ in me then that's showing up when I look at children or the generations or people who have been set aside? Or is there some other spirit in me that comes out? So looking at Jesus will tell me from the scripture what I need to learn. So the do is welcome all people. The don't is don't rebuke and reject one another. You can see Jesus pointing that out right very clearly to the disciples. Do not rebuke and reject one another on a false pretense that we've got it all figured out. <laughs> Allowing pride to settle in that I know what's best for them or for this situation in some kind of self-discovering um, determination. We need to come to God and ask for his wisdom. Lord, speak your wisdom into the moment of what's happening here. Because I want to rebuke somebody who's in my face. But Lord, I know you want to speak into this moment. So do welcome children. Do welcome all people. Don't rebuke and reject one another. And now the third application is do take time to see the value in people. Take time to see the value in people. And this is something that Nathan spoke about last week. And he said when we know our identity, when we're secure then we can look through the lens of Jesus and see other people. And again, this is something that the Holy Spirit has challenged me to look at in myself, that maybe I'm alone in this, but once in a while, do you ever have a critical thought about another person? <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? It happens to me. And what the Holy Spirit has challenged me on in the last few years is that any time a negative or a judgmental thought comes into my mind about another person, no matter what generation or demographic they're from, 
to change my thought instantly and to say, thank you for this beautiful creation, Lord. So as soon as that thought comes into my mind, I'm just like, thank you for this beautiful creation, Lord. That's how he's challenged me to see value in everyone, especially those the world has set aside. So the don't on that is don't judge. Don't be quick to judge. Don't judge. Don't be quick to speak. We're so easy to fall into the tendency that uh, we judge a book by its cover. We just look at somebody's appearance, their first words out of their mouth, and we quickly want to say, oh, I know what's wrong with this person. <laughs> As Rebecca said, let's pause in that moment and say, is this person being harmful or is this person hurting? What's on the inside of what's going on in them, God? Because you welcome people to your presence. And I so appreciate how when Jesus was brought, somebody was dragged to Jesus saying, this is a sinner. <laughs> He didn't just respond and say, yes, you're a sinner, you know, go to hell. That was not Jesus' response. He so often turned to them, said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He turned them with compassion and said, where are your accusers? We can learn so much from the heart of Christ that teaches us the heart of the Father. Don't judge, but respond with welcoming and seeing the value in people. And here's another do. Do introduce people to the kingdom of God by inviting them to come to Jesus. Just like he did with the kids. He invited them to come. So let's do the same. Let's do it. Let's introduce people to the kingdom by bringing them to Jesus' side. And therefore, don't make it hard for people to come into the kingdom. I can remember when I was younger in my faith, there were sometimes I hesitated to invite somebody to church because their language didn't quite line up. <laughs> And I thought, what if they swear in the midst of a service? And we actually had a time where we had invited a friend of mine at church. He was, he was discipling a guy, working with him, and wanting to introduce Jesus with him. And so we invited him in, and he was connecting, and, and he made a mistake. He just did something wrong, and he swore out loud right away. And, and all of a sudden, it was like, did you hear that? And, and I was glad that the church did not react when a swear word happened. Because they recognized this was someone coming searching for Jesus. We made it easy for people to come. They don't have to get all cleaned up and change everything. Come and meet Jesus and allow him to transform the heart. Don't keep people out of the kingdom. Make it easy for them to get in. And invite people to be blessed by Jesus. That's what he did, right? He invited the kids forward because he wanted to place his hands on them, pray for them. Let's do the same. Let's invite people to come be blessed by Jesus so he can speak into their spirit, speak to their mind, will, and emotions, their soul, and they can have a life-changing experience through meeting Jesus. So let's, let's invite them to be blessed by him. And so therefore, don't hold back on letting Jesus impart something to you. It could happen in our ministry times at the end of a Sunday morning when we, as pastoral team, encourage you to come forward for ministry. Uh, come forward for prayer. Allow God to impart something to you to bless you. Or turn to your friend who's with you and say, I'll go to the front with you. I'll, I'll find somebody that will pray with us together. Allow it, make it easy to allow for that blessing to happen for whoever the person is and wherever they're at. Do some of those applications sit with you? The do's, the don'ts that we can take away from the scripture about Jesus calling the little children. Well, as we close this morning, I'm just so thankful for all the lessons Jesus has taught me through children. He's so good. He knows how to get to our hearts and get us to listen, doesn't he, church? He knows that we are so drawn to children. We're just drawn to them. So he knew we, we would be drawn to this text in his word so that we could hear what he's saying. He's saying, don't set the kids aside. And by the way, don't set anyone aside. Invite everyone into my kingdom. And I had to ask myself some questions this week. Which generation, which type of people have I been setting aside? What group of folks have I not seen value in? And how does the Holy Spirit want to change my lens so I see them, I invite them, and the kingdom comes to them because what Jesus has done. So let's be a church that makes it easy for people to come to Jesus. Make it easy for them, whoever them is, to come to Jesus. Easy for people to find the kingdom of God. And that doesn't mean just by the programs we have, the way we run our services. I'm not talking about getting the right lights or the right sound. 
we're talking, this is a part of it when we gather corporately. Amen. May we make it easy for people to find Jesus. But as you go into your world, as you walk and talk and breathe and live this week, you are representing the kingdom of God. You are representing Jesus with your words, your decisions, your actions, and your reactions. So, church, may I encourage you as you go to make it easy for your coworkers, for your family members. May you just humble yourself even to say, oh, God, am I getting in the way of anybody knowing your heart? If so, God, humble me. I don't want to be a self-righteous disciple that thinks I've got it all figured out. Father, humble me, transform me so that you can shine through me and transform the people that you've brought me to do life with. Oh, church, may you hear the message that God is bringing to us today. I invite you to stand.